morning, everyone. And we start this Sunday morning with a lecture of Theodor. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody, for making it on a 9.30 on a Sunday. <laughs> it's very kind of you. <laughs> I know my place, so. Um, yeah, um, for those of you who don't know me yet, I think I've met everybody, but just in case, my name's Theodore. You can call me Theo, Ted, sometimes people call me. Um, and I guess that what I do is typically called free improvisation. Now, we've had a lot of workshops already, or lectures already, just about technical things, about uh, some ways of thinking about sound, some, provo some provocation. And I thought that I will just try to tell you what I do in relationship, piggying back on maybe some of this that's already happened. Um, since the workshops provide so much information that uh, sometimes I think it's better that somebody tries to talk about just what they do <laughs> in reality and what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. So this free improvisation, yeah, I, I, I have to say that sometimes I'm at odds with this term because I don't always agree with everything that people say about it. And it makes it a very messy field. Uh, everybody kind of contradicts each other in this field. But the, the main thing that I tend to disagree with is very often Free improvisers talk about just basing what they do in the real time on intuition. And I don't like this idea very much. I mean, of course I use intuition, I have to use intuition if I'm making things in real time. But it isn't the only way to improvise. You don't only have to think about intuition. So this kind of voice makes me feel like, well, I guess I'm a free improviser. I'm certainly not a composer, and I'm definitely not a performer. So I don't know what I am, <laughs> but hopefully you figure out something through this workshop. So in reality, what I do in a very, very practical sense is uh, I tend to think uh, rather loosely in structural terms or with kind of loose structural ideas. And then I try to create with those structural ideas in real time. This real time is actually what is the most kind of important quality for me. And uh, thinking about this idea of, well, why, why do you do something? This is a question that was brought up yesterday. Um, which is quite, it's a quite interesting question, I think, because usually somebody asks you, why do you do this? And they're expecting you to give a sentence answer or two sentence answer. But I don't think that we can really do that very well, usually. Um, and even if we do, it usually <coughs> something goes missing in this answer. What I try to think about what I do in free improvisation is what, what I value, actually. And what is most interesting for me, the artists I admire the most, are the ones who are kind of able to connect what they value in everyday life and put those values in their artwork, that there's a connection between these two. Because for me, that is kind of the function of art, is somehow that it relates to our own humanity. And that this exposes something about ourselves. So this why question then becomes extraordinarily complicated very, very quickly. Um, so, but I just have some basic things, actually, that I value. And I know that this is what makes me a free improviser. So one of the first kind of values I have is this idea of creativity. Now. There's a lot of definitions about what creativity is. And if you ask somebody on the street, just randomly, what is creative? Typically, the response you're going to get is, well, this beautiful painting is creative. Or this uh, nice building, this is creative. But it's not a very good answer, actually, because it's just an example of what happened at the end of a creative it's process. A, it's just the result of creativity, exactly. not the creativity it's, itself. It's not creativity itself. Precisely. So I'm interested in a certain kind of creativity, and I, I'm certain I'm really interested in this real time creativity. I'm interested not in necessarily taking a long period of time to develop a creative idea. I'm interested in creativity through very limited means. That if somebody put me in a performance and I didn't have an instrument and all I have is my hands 
to clap. All I can do is this. Not very interesting sound, you know. Um, but I would really try to focus on, okay, what can I do with this clap? Can I, can I try to find something to relate it to? Can I use it to trigger something in the space? What, what can I do with this very simple means? So this is my interest in creativity. It's somebody placing this uh, restriction on me somehow. And a situation does that. Real time does that. I can't do whatever I want because it's in real time. So I'm restricted to limited means. Even if the most, sometimes I improvise with extraordinarily complex setups. Guitar into pedals, into spatialization, into a computer that's doing its own thing. And it's a very complicated setup. But I'm still restricted by the timeline. There's only so much I could really do. So it's this type of creativity. And I think that my interest is in that comes from everyday life. We all have to deal with this type of creativity every day. Even when speaking in a conversation, you, you know, if you don't get out what you want to say fast enough, clear enough, and loudly enough, somebody else comes in and takes over the situation, right? So you're, you're faced with this type of creativity every day, having to be creative with very limited means. So this is probably the biggest value for me. Now this, this real time is the second biggest value. And for some reasons that are already obvious now, when I spoke about creativity, but also because this real time exposes something about art that creating a perfect composition does not. And it's this idea of error or mistake or accident or, or unintention. And in real time, nothing ever goes as perfectly as planned. I, I was giving this story to some students, probably I'm repeating it for some of you now. But you know, there's always like two types of people who organize a party. There's the person who organizes the party and they've already planned everything out. They plan where everybody sits. They plan what time the meals come. They plan when the drinks come. And they plan what types of music gets played, when it gets played. And they plan what everybody does after an hour and then maybe the next hour. And then for that person, if all of that goes the way they planned, it's a perfect party. For me, a perfect party is, hey guys, maybe we should party. And then we just see what happens. For me, that is what's interesting about the real time because we don't know what happens. Maybe one guy gets too drunk and he's really annoying, you know, and maybe, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe one girl's more flirtatious than we wanted her to be, or maybe the one we wanted her to be is not flirtatious enough, or we don't know what's gonna happen. Maybe we drink the wrong combinations of drinks, or maybe we end up in the wrong part of the city and now we're all lost, you know. Th this is my interest, actually, because there's all sorts of mistakes that lead to interesting interactions. There's all sorts of unintentional things. You could call them errors, but in my mind, they're not really errors. They're kind of provocations or, or things that make you have to adjust to the scenario. And this real time, that's where that happens most. And so this is why real time is so important to me. It's much more tied to how we deal with our everyday lives. Mm. So this leads to the third issue of you know, going farther into this artistic idea of failure. For me, it's not entirely clear what failure is for a lot of people in music. A, a, a question I always ask is, how does a composer really fail? I don't know if there's a very clear answer for this. I mean, there's opinions <laughs> about it, for sure. We have aesthetics of a perfect structure and that you have an explanation for each individual component. <coughs> but that might be failure for some people. <laughs> that you try to control this whole thing. So in free improvisation, we not only have to deal with this concept of failure, but we kind of actually have to redefine it. We have to like look at it in a different perspective and say, well, what does it actually mean for me to fail as an improviser? Does, it might actually mean something good, because now I actually have to improvise. There's one very well-known free improviser, Derek Bailey, who uh, his kind of general concept about improvisation is that it only happens through confrontation. Because if you don't get confronted, you'll always be relying on mechanisms that you know how, you know what to do. But the second that something goes wrong, there's a complete failure, and you're placed in this situation, now you really have to improvise. 
because the failure has provoked you into this situation that you don't know what to do. Now you have to find a solution. So this is my third kind of value. Mm. My fourth value in it is, um, well, this idea of community. This idea that uh, this is not something that's particular to free improvisation, but it's something that just happens to be part of it. It's, you know, you can find it in other musical fields for sure. But uh, I think that it's really important that we support each other. I think it's probably the most important thing. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we go to each other's fucking concerts and that we talk to each other about what we heard and what we thought. And this is, I have to say, maybe I'm being too provocative. In, a, in the Baltics, I find this is an enormous problem. Everybody goes to the concerts. Well, actually, not a lot of people go to concerts in town, but uh, they sit there for the concert and then they all go home. And it's, it's just the most bizarre thing to me. Because since I was playing my first concert at 14, actually the most fun was after the concert. Not, not because of getting drunk or anything, but just because we start talking about what we experienced and what we thought, and we start arguing maybe even. But we, we always keep this in I idea in mind that we are, we're kind of supporting each other, even though we might disagree. So this is one value that is part of free improvisation world that I like very much. Um, and the last one that I think, um, <coughs> well, I mean, there's plenty more, but the uh, most important one, last one, is this idea of DIY culture, or uh, do-it-yourself culture. Now, I'm not, uh, I don't support this because I like, uh, you know, things done poorly, or let's say bad video, or like low, low culture kind of aesthetics. It's nothing about this. It's just that uh, I like the, uh, I think nowadays, we have all of these means, by, you know, somebody could make a movie today with a phone, you know. We have all of these possibilities in front of us, and yet it, it seems to me that people are kind of waiting for these institutions to tell them what they're allowed to do artistically, or to tell them what to do artistically. And I think this is a completely unnecessary condition. Uh, you, you can do everything yourself now. <coughs> And I think that uh, for free improvisers, it's very common that we have to organize our own concerts because nobody likes the music that we make usually, unfortunately. So we have to organize our own concerts. We have to apply for funding. We have to try to find an audience to come. We have to think about all of these issues. And I actually, the, the longer I'm in the artistic field, the more I think that everybody should have to do that because it also creates a lot of new creative ideas and you don't have to as mentioned yesterday the concert hall already kind of tells you what you're supposed to be doing subconsciously but if you have to make a concert in some strange cellar basement some weird guy's house let's say what do you do there what are the possibilities so this do-it-yourself kind of enacts a different way of looking at the whole thing you're not waiting for somebody to give you the permission so these are the these are the kind of values that I've had over the time. Now, let's get into kind of more specific things. <coughs> and thinking about music, there's kind of three things that I think are essentially what make music a different art form from, let's say, painting, for instance. One is, is time. Time is extremely important to all of us, I would imagine. Whether we're an improviser or whether you're a composer, the bread and butter of what we do is time. And there's some really interesting concepts to start thinking about there. One is, how do we perceive time? And I, I will do a little exercise for the fun to just kind of exemplify this. So I'm going to put a stopwatch on. It's going to go for, let's say, 30 seconds, okay? And I want, what everyone I want to do is I want you to try to feel what you think is 30 seconds. And when you get to 30 seconds, just stick your hand up, okay? Now, this isn't like some sort of game. I'm not trying to prove to you that you have bad time or anything like this. I just want to, you know, to honestly think it's 30 seconds. You can, whatever tactics you want to do for how you perceive it, if you want to count or, or however, totally fine. But once you think it's been 30 seconds, put your hand up. 
Okay, <coughs> and I'll tell you in the start. Everybody ready? Start. Everybody, ah. <laughs> okay. all right, good. So, what's interesting about this already? First of, nobody went before thirty seconds. Actually, everybody's hand went up after thirty seconds. Now maybe it's the morning, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's so. The first hand that went up went up at thirty-two seconds. So somebody was pretty close. And the last hand that went up went up at forty-eight seconds, actually. So it, I say 30 seconds, but in reality, between all of these people, we have, what is that, 16 seconds of difference between one person and another. So this idea of perceiving time, it's different for everybody. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a finite thing, you know. And I, I think for a lot of these free improvisation guys, this was the main, one of the main things to start thinking about when abandoning metric meter and rhythm and thinking the way that we have always thought about rhythm and, and instead rely on some sort of intuitive sense of time. Because it doesn't make any sense, actually, when you think about it. The fact that each person, it's almost 20 seconds difference in time, why are we dividing things up all very equally all of the time? You know, if one person feels it longer and another person feels it shorter, it, it doesn't necessarily represent all of us to divide up the time so perfectly equally. So let's try one more kind of exercise all right so there's this really there's this really great piece by uh, Paulina Oliveros who's a wonderful lady from the US uh, electroacoustic improvisation composer and she has one very very simple idea it's called uh, on before or after and the the idea is you have a very very short sound very very simple means and what you're supposed to do is try to decide where to place this simple sound. And you have three options. You can try to do it before somebody else, you can try to do it at the same time as somebody else, or you can do it after somebody else. Now this before and after, we're not saying how much before or how much after. It could be 10 seconds after. You could try to get in right before somebody, like uh, right before they come in. Or you can like think, probably somebody comes in in 10 seconds. So this is my before, all right? Okay, so does everybody understand this general idea? We're all gonna use claps to make it simple. Okay, so let's maybe do, let's say like a, let's do like a three minute piece. Everybody gets a clap, five claps. You're only allowed five. You're limited to five claps. And you're trying to do this before, at the same time, or slightly after somebody, okay? Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, so I'll tell you when to start. So yeah, let's. I mean, we don't have a ton of time, so maybe, maybe four minutes. <coughs> so if you don't get all of your claps in four minutes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just because of practically. Otherwise, we could sit here for 24 hours, and then one guy's just. Yeah, yeah. It's, but we we <laughs> don't have the time for this, unfortunately. Can we look at the salary? Hmm. Maybe we look at the salary. Whatever means you want to use. I, uh, for me, yes, yeah, sure. The gesture can sometimes help you, but I think for me, when I first did this exercise, I really wanted to see if I could anticipate the sound. That I could anticipate that somebody's going to clap, you know. Because this is the hardest one. The, at the same time, you can kind of get pretty close at, but this getting in right before somebody, this is hard. You kind of have to anticipate. And so for me, I tried, well, the first few times I tried to do it, this in my life, I, I tried to just think about the sound. Um, but I guess if you want to try to use gesture, sure, why not? Okay? Is everybody ready? Okay. 
Start. That's four minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think maybe maybe one thing I didn't describe. You only get five claps, not at one time, but through the whole thing. <laughs> but it's okay. Um, what did you think about this? Mm -hmm. I cannot actually could feel when the clap was coming. No, it had a, I actually got it where I wanted each time. Mm -hmm. Like right before or like after or mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that has something to do with, I mean, I have my eyes closed, mm -hmm. but I think I did kind of a big gesture, so maybe someone with the eyes closed kind of felt it unconscious and joined. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that what happens is there's some sort of intuitive structuring going on where you just think someone's probably going to clap at this moment. 
nobody knows why you think this, but there's some sort of sense of time that you start to develop that's anticipating structural possibilities, the moment something's going to happen. And it, sometimes it happens that you're wrong, actually. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. And you think, I'm going to get it, here it comes, here it comes, and right before, and then nothing happens. And you're like, what? <laughs> you know? Yeah? And I think that this is, uh, yeah, it's one thing you see. Anybody else? I also thought like that I could feel the tension before the clap that I wanted to clap on. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if you've had, if you, uh, anybody here heard about the, the Japanese uh, technique, Yohaku which is the same that are used in theater schools, that uh, the group of people, they have to start clapping at the same time. Mm -hmm. and they have uh, clappings in three stages. The first stage is that they're clapping really slowly, mm -hmm. but at the same time, then the second stage is that they're clapping a little bit faster, but at the same time, and the third one is that they're clapping as fast as they can, but at the same time. But they so have to keep together. They all mm -hmm. have to keep together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's like something similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and y you can also like feel the pressure, the tension mm -hmm. before each clap. It's mm. it's gonna come, and it might be because of the structural thinking. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other? Well, one general observation uh, mm. regarding timing. Yeah. Uh, people were generally hurrying a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the beginning had a lot of claps in it. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. It's it was the second part quite silent yes yeah yeah and it's almost intuitive that people you but I mean since everybody kind of decided to disobey the rule of five claps <laughs> that was thrown out of the way but then what's interesting to me is that somehow if the beginning is all of this mess of clapping then somehow everyone also decides well maybe it shouldn't be this way all of the time and the whole thing changes but there's no reason why you have you could have just kept doing this game where it was very active but somehow you already decide that, okay, this is a lot of clapping. Maybe there should be some spots without clapping at all, like for a while. So, and, and this is what this exercise actually starts to provoke in me, is this idea that um, you can still think structurally as an improviser. You can think, uh, you can take a very simple, basic premise on, before, or after. And that starts to not only... Um, it starts to give you different ways of thinking about how to divide up the time. That uh, that if you if everybody's been like ka 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 ka, you might think okay, yeah, we'll wait a bit, you know, and then okay, mine's going to be before like twenty seconds before the next thing. You clap, and then everybody claps. And, Damn it! Now you have to change very quickly. But the structure integrity of dividing up the time still stays the same somehow. A structure emerges out of this. And these are, these are the types of things that I love as an improviser. This is what I really enjoy, actually, is finding some sort of structural way of thinking of how I deal with the real time. So, and uh, especially once we start to think about how we feel time, we start to feel it in different ways, depending on how we think about the structure, how we're dealing with the situation. So that's one aspect about music, now thinking about time. Ah, crap, we really don't have a lot of time left. Okay, I just have 15 minutes to do one simple thing. So, uh, we had this, uh, we had some discussions yesterday about this idea of kind of thinking about sound and how sound is interpreted. And yesterday we had some, like, uh, ecology. Of the idea that you somehow get encoded with uh, ways of an interpreting perception. Where the, the example was biting the table, which was quite funny, actually. Um, what is interesting for me, though I think this is absolutely true, that you know we get encoded with ways of perceiving things at a very young age. What's interesting for me is that we don't really know how that happens. We have some general ideas, but for me, a lot of listening is cultural. It's not like a biological truth that the major scale is somehow naturally part of us it's something that becomes cultural over time and it actually frames how we listen to things and so what I try to do in my practice is find different ways of listening to a sound that I don't think that the sound already contains inside of it the truth of how I listen to it I think it's about my perspective 
on how I'm going to choose to listen to it. And there's a really nice example if I have, if there's, if there's a braised soul here who's willing to uh, play. It won't require, okay, what instrument do you play? Piano. Okay, yeah, come on up. Okay. I get to torture you now for a bit. <laughs> 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 so there's this really interesting system developed by uh, Karl Heinz Stockhausen, who I sometimes think is a crazy guy, a very crazy guy actually. But this system, I think, is one of the best kind of graphic notation ideas, and it's called uh, plus or minus. Now he developed this system in the mid '60s, and he was trying to think about different graphic ways of getting the ensemble to respond without using traditional notation. So he's trying to find new structural ways for organizing sound inside of the ensemble. So it works this way, if I can remember. So you have you know, a series of, the score literally looks like uh, something like this. It's just columns of pluses and minuses and pluses and minuses. And they're organized into different, uh, let's say, rows. So the first row is something like, let's say, frequency or pitch, if you want. The second row could be something like dynamics. I don't have a way to write this. Um, the, the third row could be something like speed. Would you have like a better pen, maybe? <laughs> this is what they gave me. <laughs> it's most important for him, but uh, um, I don't know. Sorry. Can you... so? Can everybody at least generally understand what it's saying here? Okay. Sorry, this is all they, they have in this very advanced modern uh, <laughs> technology <laughs> studio. We can't get a decent fucking pen. Um, and the third is, um, it's a bit difficult to, to describe. I think about it in terms of the amount of particles inside of the sound. So. You can have sounds that uh, they just have maybe like one action inside of it, it's just boah, and nothing really changes. But you can also have sounds in the same time duration that have a lot of particles inside of it. You, know, you can have boah, 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 boah. So this particles is so if you know one sound has more particles, then you have to add more if it's a plus, and if it's minus, then you try to take away the number of particles. So this can get extraordinarily complicated very, very, very fucking quickly, actually. And of course, you don't only have to think about these uh, categories. Maybe there's others. So here's the way it's going to work uh, for me torturing you. <laughs> okay. The way it works in the original plus minus score is there's an impulse. And the, I believe what they used was a radio. So somebody just plays a radio. And you as the performer then have to relate to that sound this way. So the radio sound comes on. Blah, 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 and then you have to look, listen to this sound. Analyze it, go up in frequency, in this case, down in dynamics from that sound, slower, and more particles, okay? And particles are just like, like... The number of actions inside of the thing. Okay. So I think of it, the best way to think about it at the moment is just moments okay. at the moment. It's just in one kind of moment. So you understand? Yeah. So I will give you some sort of... Uh, impulse I will find something really quickly I don't know what it will be okay. and then yeah you try to analyze that sound and then try to play in these parameters okay okay all right and just one action or one you know gesture okay okay makes sense uh, what to use <laughs> maybe maybe I use um, maybe I use a radio So I have no idea what this is going to be. <laughs> but that's but, fun. Yeah, but I'll just let it play for you know so many seconds, and then you have to try to figure that out. Yeah.
Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what, how do we feel about his success rate? Does do it feel okay? Did he go up in frequency? Yeah. Yeah, he went up in frequency. Did he go down in dynamics? Yeah. Yeah, he went down in dynamics. Did he go down in speed? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky one, especially <laughs> when you start to think about this particles as well, actually. Yeah. But I think you did go down in speed, actually. Okay. For me, I think. And then you went up in part. You went really up in particles. Oh. Yeah. You did a lot of actions compared to how many actions were inside of this, right? But okay, maybe maybe we try to mess with you even more. So, um, <laughs> so we take we just if you can remember what you did more or less. So now we're going to go up in frequency again. Let's go uh, up in dynamic. Let's go even slower, and let's go even more particles. This is like torture for a person, you know? <laughs> it's really fucking difficult. Yeah, I remember the first time that I did this with some people. It was exactly like actually you're doing it much faster. Oh. It was actually like uh, okay, so that was the action. Okay, uh, up in frequency, uh, uh, up in dynamics. It's it's this really slow um, thing. So uh, yes, actually, in some ways it's incredibly impractical mm. at first to think this way, but we can actually start to listen this way. We can take a sound and think, okay, this is one way that we can relate to the sound. Um, and the reason that it's so slow is because we just don't do this. Mm -hmm. It just breaks how we culturally kind of relate to sound. It's, and this is why I think the system is so genius, is because it actually creates a new way of listening and a new way of relating to the sound. And this is, this is something that is extremely interesting to me is not to rely purely on kind of my intuitions, but how do I start to build new intuitions? And when you do that, it's torture. Like, it's exactly like this, you know, that's a, okay, this works, I can kind of hear sound this way, but to actually start to think this way might result in sitting there like, oh, <laughs> shit, you know, it, it was supposed to be louder, and I'm still playing this quiet thing, you know? So <coughs> these are the types of things that interest me. And the, the, there's certainly types of ways that you can start thinking about improvisation. Now, um, since we have no time left, I don't get to talk about space at all, which is kind of really bad of me since the whole workshop was supposed to be about this. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but fuck it, right? Yeah. Um, since we have five minutes left, maybe you have some questions that I can try to answer. Or not. <laughs> Thank you. You said three things that difference from music and picture, and you only mentioned. Uh, yeah, the, the last I wanted to talk about was this idea of space. Okay. Now I think that space. I think when we say that space has not played an integral part in music, which was said yesterday, I think to some extent this is very true, but it hasn't actually always been true. If you go back and look at the really old Baroque church music, Antiphony, spatialized Antiphony, where parts of the choir are put in different areas of the church, and they kind of respond, this was an important aspect. Generally, for me, if I try to give just this one sentence answer about space, what is interesting for me, what I want to find is the balance between my own individualization in the space and being part of the space. If I were to try to provoke uh, Stefan, I would say that I don't want to impose upon the space what I think the space should be. I want to walk into the space and see what it is first and let the, somehow the space inform me and try to actually work with it. This goes back to this value of working with people, actually. <laughs> it's really important for me to let the space 
be what it is and see if I can integrate myself somehow, which is I very philosophical. I don't have time to describe how I practically do it, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and then... Yeah. <coughs> I just wanted to... Uh, uh, a couple of things that you, s that you said, I mean, in, in this, this aspect of making music that you call do it yourself, between how I am as a, as a person and what I do. Mm -hmm. I just remember this, this is a fantastic uh, interview quite late and uh, uh, John Coltrane thought and, uh, and he says you know, something along the lines that well, if, if you want to be a good musician a musician you have to be a good person. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just one of those things it's like, well, it's self-evident when you hear it but, mm -hmm. but it's not that uh, I mean, then, then we have this, uh, uh, you know, music history is is filled with assholes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really great music. But maybe so that's what they value. So, <laughs> you, so, yeah, but I think this is something we need to talk about a Absolutely. little bit uh, more. I think it's under this ethical aspect of, uh, because the kind of listening, uh, uh, like the listening exercises that you bring up brings with them an ethical perspective. Absolutely. And this is what interests me. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, to approach the other. This is uh, in core for me. Way. Yeah. So, so that musical practice then can become this sort of vehicle for mm -hmm. yeah. ethical. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, I think that I think the idea that we try to separate the two actually isn't possible. No. It, it becomes encoded in the activity itself. You just don't necessarily realize that that is what's happening. You're automatically the second you choose even a genre of music, you're agreeing to some sort of principles. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not opposed to the principles. I'm just opposed to not being honest about what they are. This is or not being aware. Or not being aware of what they are. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. And I think we just have time for one more. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have uh, a lot about uh, well some things uh, thought about uh, improvisation and live electronics and uh, mm. I came to this uh, it's just a comment for uh, for your speech and uh, and uh, so as you talk you uh, have your guitar set up and whatever so but uh, I think in this way uh, live electronic for me uh, uh, will uh, brought for me the idea that of course, we cannot have really free improvisation at all. Yeah, it's a bit because it's, it's, we have we are, it's o we are yeah. only free mm -hmm. in a certain environment. Or it depends on how you want to define this term yeah. freedom. But the the classic nineteen sixties mm. kind of freedom that they discuss it turns out more that it was freedom in the opposition of yeah. something. Of course. Yeah, this yeah. is typically what happens. Is yeah. I, people say when you're uh, I, I like one friend of mine puts yeah. it this way when you're young and you, you say you're free, it's because you don't do something <laughs> that you don't think that the, that you should should be done. And then when you get older, you're kind of mm. like, oh, mm. I wasn't so free. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, and sometimes mm. I, uh, I was thinking, uh, of course, about the relation between composition and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, improvisation or how to define it. When I see the maybe... Uh, hours or days or weeks for program a patch uh, what I use for improvising mm -hmm. for improvising quotation uh, marks uh, in uh, in uh, in real time in mm -hmm. in live situations and I I think uh, so uh, building the patch so that is more like composition it's almost more important than yeah, the free improv part yeah. of course yeah. that is uh, I, I, I compose the environment or I'm mm -hmm. like an uh, instrument designer yes yes and then yeah. of course I can, uh, uh, and then uh, of course I am in 
during the imp improvisation I am limited to that so I cannot say okay mm -hmm. I now in I cannot spontaneously uh, decide I, w I want now um, and now have an FM synthesis uh, unless I haven't that programmed before For or sure. I haven't pre sure. prepared before it. I think yeah. the same is with the physical with this um, well, it's the same as even if you choose an talent. instrument. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I just have to answer briefly and then we can move to the next uh, Yeah, okay. Lecture. But but I think one of the things that I I find the only real fundamental difference and it's a big difference b between composer and improviser is a generally the composer is interested and it's not now it's gotten very messy so what I'm about to say is almost untrue but traditionally composer is interested in a final product that gets repeated yeah. that, that is the that is the kind of direction most composers work in yeah. the improvisers not necessarily in fact they can't be interested yeah. in producing they can be interested in producing an experience but it's an experience that happens in a moment yeah. because repeating that experience makes it not improvisation anymore you know just in theory but otherwise whatever processes you might use they could be the same as the composer's processes. Why not? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, uh, and the, the, the second thing about that is that if you decide to d design the instrument, it is kind of different, actually, from being an improviser. But an improviser doesn't escape the fact that the piano's been... It's just that somebody's already done that. Yeah. That's really the, uh, the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Gentlemen, um, uh, technical problems are the story of my life. Uh, I was going to do uh, uh, an introductory lecture to the system I'm using for spherical sound, which is uh, Eurocom Spot. And after a lot of head scratching last night, uh, I came right from Stockholm, where I was at EMS. And I want to show you the work I've been doing there. It worked fine there. Uh, for my computer last night, not so. Uh, so instead of uh, you watching me trying to solve problems in Max on screen, I will just do something else and talk about myself. Uh, it will be probably more fun than Spot anyway. Uh, so just uh, a quick run through. Uh, uh, I'm born in a place called the Westman Islands in 1960. I'm born late in the year, so I'm still 57 years old. Uh, and I moved to the big city when I was eight. Copal is basically a suburb of Reykjavik. Uh, before I got seriously into uh, classical music or, or, or whatever you want to call it, uh, I played guitar in punk bands. And, uh, uh, this is Iceland's first punk band, uh, and that's me. <laughs> uh, I quit that to form Iceland's first new wave band, uh, and <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, and uh, from there on, uh, I went downhill. Uh, uh, to an ordinary rock band uh, that got me totally fed up with rock music for decades. Um, so from 1981 to 2009, uh, I think I did two session jobs in the 1990s and that was all. Uh, I changed instruments to first classical guitar and then to this beauty here. Uh, well, my first <laughs> instrument was a lot bigger and a lot slower. Uh, and then after getting a little bit fed up with this beautiful mm. instrument, uh, I joined my f first band again. Uh, so since 2012, uh, you catch me playing punk regularly. 
and I love it. Uh, uh, academically, um, uh, I went to many schools, so I'm not going to bother with all of them. Uh, basically studying guitar, uh, history and composition in Reykjavik and in New York uh, with these and those guys. And uh, I did my one and only orchestral piece in 1987. Uh, discovered after that that I hated orchestral music. Uh, I hated instrumental music. Uh, and whatever, uh, but just to <laughs> uh, get you into my line of thinking. Now I'm a bit older than most of you. Um, uh, analog was dead at the time, uh, and it's dead to me still. Don't even get me started on discussing that. Uh, uh, computers were the future, but at the time I was living in Iceland, which was at that time before the internet, a very remote place, far away from everywhere. And the country had two computers, uh, one run by the University of Iceland and the other one run by all the banks in common. Uh, <laughs> and I was pretty sure they would not let me work on them. <laughs> uh, so that's why I studied instrumental music, to study anything. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, uh, yeah, having a way to do something with music, but uh, I was so wrong, uh, uh, and that's lesson number one, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, say some words of wisdom uh, once in a while. Um, uh, lesson one in your studies, don't be practical. <laughs> Um, I was practical and I regret it. <laughs> um, I mean, I should have gone into computer programming rather than music studies. I know that now. Um, uh, so whatever you think about the future, uh, don't worry too much. Uh, what you learn in school will be useless in 20 years anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the best education you get is a continuing education. Uh, school can give you good basics to start from. Uh, but yeah, basically everything I learned in school is uh, not 20 years ago, but 30 years ago. Uh, I don't really use that much anymore. Uh, uh, finally, uh, at age, oh yes, and what happened during my last years is that MIDI happened. Uh, digital synthesis for the common people happened uh, around the time I finished school. Uh, so I continued studies later uh, in The Hague, uh, studying mostly electronic music and algorithmic music. Uh, by the way, that was my way into uh, doing instrumental music at the time, uh, was to program a computer to compose it. Because, um, uh, yeah, like I said before, I was so fed up with everything I heard. Um, basically, uh, who was it? Uh, Dutch composer Louis Andriessen, he said, it uh, doesn't matter what you write for orchestra, it just sounds like orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that was the feeling I really had. Uh, you can do effects, you can do sounds, and somebody had already done it. Uh, so why bother? Uh, maybe you should go back and write symphonies, but oh no, Beethoven did that. So, uh, don't worry. Anyway, uh, he, when I was in my 30s, uh, I finally got access to a studio and started doing electronic music. I did other boring things at the time, like having raising children and uh, uh, having a life. Uh, but <laughs> uh, then in my late 30s, I, I started composing again when I finally had the means to do so electronically and digitally. Um, <coughs> And um, uh, I've had a long teaching career in uh, 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 Reykjavik College of Music, which used to be the National Conservatory in Iceland, which changed in 2001 to Iceland Academy of the Arts. Uh, but I've always kept on teaching at this school because that school has a much, much better studio than any of the other schools. Um, 
So I will teach music history classes there once a week uh, in order to have access to that studio. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, yes, I'm going to finally play something. Uh, oops. Uh, my first comeback piece uh, was called Fantasia over Lilia, uh, uh, which was quadraphonic. And just to tell you the state of the history, this was the uh, first surround piece ever done in Iceland, and I had to go to Denmark to mix it. <laughs> uh, uh, but by 2000, we had a really first class studio in that local music school. Uh, and I did a remix called Brot, which means fragments. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but uh, this is based on a very old Icelandic folk song called Lilja. Uh, and everything you hear is little pieces from that song, uh, uh, deformed in various ways and played through as FM synthesis. Uh, and this Broad thing is um, uh, pieces uh, and I will start like here. So if you know the song you will might recognize it but you probably don't know the song so don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, and I didn't do a sound check of this. This should play out in roughly eight channels around. And it doesn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can somebody tell me why? <laughs> the master? Uh, I think I did. Ah. Uh, master of Union. It's already rotated. Ah, okay, okay, so we don't need this. <laughs> and here we need to add the outputs. I just need to channel outputs. And so that it sounds even, we have to go here. I think we don't need these, definitely. <laughs> Oh, you change it. Okay. Uh, I'll change it to. We <laughs> <laughs> don't need this already. So now, through the narrow master, it should play from the Sony code. Ah, it's playing. It's just very soft. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. So. <laughs> I should warn you, before this goes any further, uh, there are some very high frequencies in there that I can't hear. 
Uh, you might hear them and be in pain. I don't know. Continue. Um, um, for the next two years, I was very busy doing uh, multi channel pieces like this, uh, except uh, I threw out synthesis. And everything I've done since is uh, based on recorded sound and ma manipulation of recorded sound. And uh, uh, to represent this period, it's probably a lead on number two. Uh, it means basically the state of your health. And um, uh, I got the uh, inspiration one time when I had basically everything wrong with my throat and nose and lungs and I was coughing and, uh, in a really, really bad way. And I say, yes, that's an idea. Uh, so I went to a party, uh, drank a lot, smoked a lot. Uh, went home, uh, drank a lot of whiskey, smoked more, uh, and the morning after I recorded all the sounds from my own mouth. <laughs> uh, and the whole <laughs> recording process took about 10 minutes before my voice was totally shot for six days. I, I, I had to whisper for six days. Uh, and uh, now we come to another lesson, and this is... Uh, uh, why are we doing music if we do it for someone else? Uh, uh, should we uh, uh, do this to apply uh, appeal to their reason or to their feelings? Uh, basically, do you sit down and say, this is a very good composition, thank you? Or, or should you basically feel it? And uh, uh, the best comment on my music uh, is from an older man that heard this piece and uh, he came to me afterwards and told me this was the worst piece of shit he had heard ever in his life uh, this was not music uh, so i will so and yet for you technically minded this is done like 95 percent on a system called kima which is a hardware processor full of dsp chips uh, with a programming language running on top of it. I have thought on that. Could you maybe turn down the volume just a bit before you start playing? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it was, it pretty was loud. loud and, and this seems a lot louder than the one before. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't have the same high frequency content. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> I will start it as is. 
And if it's too loud, I will turn it down. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So long, so on for a long, long time. And, uh, talking about emotional responses, uh, I played this once for a, a colleague of mine just in the studio, and he sat back, listened to all of this, uh, and after it finished, uh, he looked at me and said, "Oh my, you desperately need a woman." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, at around this time I started playing live again, this time with the uh, same old electric guitar but with live electronics, uh, with this band, uh, a recorder player, computer player and guitar player, uh, and later another band which is the heaviest band I've ever been in. Uh, it's called Icelandic Sound Company, and uh, it's me and a percussion player. Uh, my equipment is like this big and weighs 10 kilos. His equipment, last time we weighed it, it was 1,100 kilos. Uh, uh, touring with this was not fun, uh, but I still do it once in a while. Uh, oops, what happened here? has all this uh, expensive uh, instruments in I on Iceland? No, he's in Switzerland actually. Oh. <laughs> so I fly a lot. And, uh, Who's the guy? Uh, he's, he's an Icelandic guy called Gunnar Kristinsson. Okay. Uh, he used to travel Europe and play this, improvise. And uh, he doesn't anymore. It became too much for him when it became older. And uh, it, the, here's one lesson about improvisation, because uh, uh, Ted was talking here before about structure of improvisation. Uh, when we started out playing, we, we said, yeah, we, we learn structure for five minutes, we do this, 10 minutes, we do this. And then we started playing, and we never did any of it. <laughs> uh, that's what I like about improvisation. Uh, it can go ways you can't imagine. Uh, there's only one thing we've ever decided regarding performance and really stuck to it. That is, how long are we going to play? Uh, because uh, if you go on for longer, you start to bore people. Uh, 
and uh, I'm going to do uh, before that I will play about half a minute from a piece I made from the sounds of these gongs um, and I called it bronze uh -huh. and the subs might start feeling a little pain soon No, that won't work. Okay. Uh, this is uh, me playing live uh, electric guitar. So there's no pre-recordings, no synthesis. This is just electric guitar. And I'm trying to... Yeah. And excuse the video, when I appear, this is 10 years old. I look much better then. Stop this here. 
uh, <coughs> and I've done some more stuff and some more stuff and maybe another example from uh, my field reporting days. I, I went to Icelandic nature and recorded lots of sounds. And uh, actually not going to play this. I'm uh, going to play this one, uh, which is a more all-in-one. This is from a project uh, of several composers from the Nordic countries and South America, where we recorded a lot of sounds at home. Uh, put up on an FTP side and then made a piece using your own sounds and from some of the other continent. So this is a very strange combination of Icelandic sounds from nature and some crazy South Americans talking in Spanish. Uh, I was wondering for a long time how to uh, make this happen together. Uh, I couldn't figure out why or how. So I just improvised. And uh, at the moment I thought this was about the worst piece I have ever done. Um, in hindsight, uh, it sounds a lot better 10 years later. Uh, it's also one of my most performed pieces, so it can't be all bad. And uh, now we go back to... Sorry. Tolmex X. X. This. story short, uh, uh, as much as I had gotten fed up with instrumental music at the time, I got fed up with electronic music at the time, um, or acousmatic, or what you like to call it. Uh, so I had a period where I tried to make instrumental music, didn't come out right, so I had a period doing live coding, I uh, found out that I was just a little bit old to uh, start something really new like that. Um, <coughs> So I got depressed, grew a beard, uh, started playing with my old punk band, um, remixed some old mono uh, electronic pieces, uh, and then basically took two years of making an album with my punk band. Uh, started again <coughs> in 2016, uh, doing a couple of pieces, and uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, elaborate maybe on what Stefan said yesterday. Um, uh, I'm getting so fed up going to electronic music concerts, uh, even to listen to myself. Um, and there's not many people doing it. And I'm basically getting tired. Oh, I shouldn't say this. Uh, so I actually enjoy more playing with my rock band than uh, doing classical music. So after the next piece, 
which I basically have to finish because I got so many grants. Uh, <laughs> life is hard. Life is hard. Uh, uh, after that, I will do rock music for maybe four years before going back to something like this, uh, because uh, sitting in a studio. Uh, I mean, I am a very meticulous perfectionist person, so I really have to do studio pieces, uh, uh, unless I play something live, in which case, uh, whatever works, works. Um, but uh, doing this on a stage with a screaming audience is always more fun uh, than sitting in the studio. Um, so I'm going to end by playing... Uh, uh, a piece called Emezzo. Uh, this is basically like a halfway piece uh, into the piece that was played at the concert day before yesterday. Uh, it is mostly the same piece, uh, the pacing is a little different and it's a five channel piece uh, whereas the specialization uh, of the piece day before yesterday was uh, uh, basically program programmed, flowing, changing all the time uh, this time it's totally deterministic, so mostly the same piece, uh, totally different specialization. Uh, I called it Emezzo because it was like halfway uh, to finishing the other piece. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, this is uh, it uh, for me now. Uh, any questions? Yep. Well, you play so much music you said you're fed up with. I would like to hear some of the punk uh, band. Uh, I didn't bring that with me. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of uh, in another phase, or I, I didn't even think. Uh, but uh, I can say that they are very, very local to Iceland. Uh, they will fall on totally deaf ears anywhere else. <laughs> so you're not missing that much. But some of that is on SoundCloud? Uh, my stuff is on SoundCloud, yeah. Uh, Punk stuff is on Spotify. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, but I'm not giving you the name of the band. Why? Uh, because, because they are local to Iceland. Nobody would know them. And I, I honestly don't think anybody would care. I don't care. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you can, uh, if you are, in case we are able to, pre to make this fancy uh, Icelandic characters. Yeah, we yeah. uh, Press new oh, documents. Okay. New, new documents on the <coughs> your left. Um, no, new what? <laughs> and I thought in this like this name. <laughs> uh, I think it's dot com. Smaller and louder. And it has <laughs> has a three B. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah it's a it's an intentional misspelling. Uh, there is an Icelandic word that has two Bs, uh, which is uh, basically the male organs of a plant, and uh, we were basically doing the Icelandic version of the name Sex Pistols. So, uh, any more questions? Or across different kind of uh, styles or genres or something that we call like that. But there is still something connected to that. In any case, I mean, how do you feel with uh, yourself and what are the other contexts? Uh, yeah. How different how we work? He's, uh, he's asking about the difference of how I work uh, uh, regarding which uh, concept I'm doing. Uh, and the answer is, uh, uh, if I'm in the studio, um, I'm very meticulous, do things really well. Uh, if I'm live, I'm very free to do anything. I'm absolutely not afraid of doing mistakes. I love doing mistakes. It's, uh, uh, and I do this, this is regardless of genre. Or, okay. <laughs> uh, no, just like how, because we were talking about how inaccessible technology was at the time. Yeah. Understand? Like, how did you get interested in electronics and doing? I, I can't remember, but I, I heard about this. Oh, okay. I read about this <laughs> and I found some records. This was before the internet. Yeah. yeah well, I was just going to make a, a, a comment that I can really relate to this. I mean, the, the, I think what you're uh, talking about, the, the freedom of, of being a performer where you, you can do whatever you want and then and the sort of dialectic between that mode of, of, of working and studio work and how difficult it can be sometimes to, to well, navigate in that yeah. way. So. Thank you. Okay. So, well, thank you. Uh, okay. yeah. uh, have you ever tried any other solutions for making for dealing with the problem that you think it's for to go like to electric music concerts instead of just not doing it like what will uh, no <laughs> uh, problem is that with electro acoustic music I, i'm really a hi-fi guy uh, uh, my music doesn't really work in, in a in a raw basement with anything goes uh it has to be properly produced properly set up or it won't work so i'm pretty locked in the concert hall. So, well, okay, thank you. Gentlemen, <laughs> the last one to present the last of the lunches. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will uh, 
present today. Uh, not so many weeks ago, I defended my thesis called Composing the Performance in Stockholm, uh, a thesis in artistic research, uh, exploring musical composition in uh, contemporary theater. So I've been working in uh, for soon almost 10 years, so eight, eight years of last uh, uh, quite intensively uh, working in that field, kind of exploring how musical composition can, or how you can work in new theater. And uh, interesting to hear, hear your uh, talk, Ricardo, and as well as Stefan yesterday, I mean, talking about also this, the how, I mean, going away from, from maybe the more classical work of the composer, either in the studio or writing scores and so on, and, and performing or going back to the studio, and also as Stefan uh, spoke about yesterday, making this performative art, and, and, uh, and I guess it has been similar f f for, uh, in, in my case, I, uh, my background is uh, as a classically trained composer, I've been writing a lot of chamber music, and a lot of orchestra music, uh, as well as electronic music, and often combined instrument and electronics, that has been one area that I've been finding very interesting, but I've been also doing work with, with other artists and so on, and uh, uh, I don't think I get that tired of things as Ricardo described. I'm, I'm kind of the opposite. <laughs> I'm more, I'm getting too interested in things. That I guess that's my problem because I want to do everything. <laughs> why I get so interested in, okay, I want to explore this and explore this. Even if the symphony orchestra sometimes do sound as an orchestra, but I keep writing that anyway. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, so, so, um, um, so uh, after many years, I have finished this rather big work, and, and uh, uh, one question that you uh, struggling with uh, when it comes to artistic research is how to present it, and then I mean when it comes to documentation about writing and all these things. So, but it ended up as a book. Uh, I don't have that many copies, but I, I can send some around so you can have a little look and. So it is a book, but you can also find it as a PDF uh, online, and there is a, an accompanying website to it, so you can send that book around yourself. Um, uh, where there, uh, because when I talk about things uh, or describe things, I made examples, so you can find examples, and there is the documentation, so texts and scores and so on. And I will show you show you the website uh, a little later. And uh, so. Uh, the field has been rather broad. I mean, I have my background in, in, as I say, contemporary music, but also in electronic music, which is a big part of this work, the electronic music, and also uh, working with specialized sound is an important part of, in these works, in all these works. Uh, and it also radiophonic art is an important ingredient, as well as what is called post-traumatic th theater in more modern experimental theater. And I will talk a bit about composed theater, and we also sometimes use the term called sonic art theater, which is kind of stage, staged radio, radiophonic art. And I've been doing, this is not a kind of work you do on your own, but this is work you have to do or um, uh, in collaboration with other artists. So I've been working with a theater group called Theater by my Malmö, and uh, especially with a playwright and director, Jürgen Dahlqvist. Um, and um, let's see. So in the thesis, I'm, I'm basing it on, on five performances, quite different works. Uh, and I will present them shortly uh, in a minute. Uh, but during all these years, there, there, there has also been a number of other works uh, that have been really important also for, for, for the work, but I don't talk so much about it, but for example, one work, uh, more recent work called Arrival Cities Hanoi, which is a piece for Vietnamese instruments and chamber ensemble and electronics, and where, where we worked also with documentary video and, and soundscapes, uh, collecting sounds from Hanoi. A really, really interesting project, and if you can say that that's a kind of a <coughs> continuation of the of the of my thesis or the, the things I have been exploring. Uh, 
And basically there are uh, kind of two areas that I'm looking into or investigate. And, and it's on, on the one hand, my, my own work with, I mean, how I take my experiences in uh, musical composition and bringing them into the theater. And I mean, my work there on what kind of things I bring in and, and methods. <coughs> And the other thing is uh, the question about collaboration with other artists. How do you work with text, with the actors, and how do you relate to staging and scenography and so on? And all this, there are so many questions when you come into this. I mean, it's not necessarily easy to, to work with a lot of people on how, how, in which order should you do things and so on. So there is a big uh, part of the thesis is really about how we have been uh, working with these things or how its collaborative work ha ha has evolved through these works. And um, uh, I would like to... show some video. Um, so I will uh, just play, uh, uh, say a few words about these works, and you can find a lot of more of them uh, in the text and uh, on, the, on the website. And, uh, and, and um, because what I'm, I've been looking for there or, uh, in these works is really, uh, or the idea was to to make a series of works where you have kind of different ensemble, a different combination of of things or of staging. Um, and uh, the first work in here is uh, one called Indy 500, Seth Masude, uh, based on uh, uh, some uh, text or quotation from the Futuristic Manifest, uh, and especially about speed. And uh, Jorgen, who wrote the text, uh, connects very much the, their fascination of speed and con kind of relates that to, to the fascination of, I mean, speed in our society when it comes to consumption and, 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 and so on. And um, uh, yeah, we'll play uh, just the, the opening of the piece uh, as you will hear. Uh, and it's for, yeah, sorry, it's for, for three actors and for uh, three musicians, saxophone, uh, electric guitar, um, or several different guitar, and percussion and electronics. And the uh, and it's uh, it's all like a car race, and so at one point the car race starts, and then they are counting the rounds, and, and in the performance it was an a uh, surround setup, or I think it was eight channel, so you could hear like sound just going around, uh, or like this in one part of the uh, piece, and in the end comes this uh, crash where there's a lot of smoke and things. I don't have a very good video, so here are some photos from uh, the performance. Yeah, so we'll call them, we'll call them. It finns tre storheter. Hastighet. Acceleration. Och massa. Och störst av dem är hastighet. Även hastigheten, hastighet. Även jag, hastighet. Allt hastighet. Även jag, hastighet. Vi förklarar världens härlighet. Även jag hastighet. Berikats med ny skönhet. Fartens skönhet. Även jag hastighet. En räsebil med motorhuven pryd. Även jag hastighet. Med stora tuber som liknar ormar med explosiv andedräkt. Även jag hastighet. En rytande automobil som verkar driven. Även jag hastighet. Av en kul spruta är vackrare än Nike från Samo Tracke. Även jag hastighet. 
Hazret. Ray Harun är profeten som beskrev värdet av hastighet. Även Ray hastighet. Och Kenny från Sverige hans lärjunga. Även Kenny hastighet. Gör Gud av människan krävde människan. Även Gud hastighet. Gör Gud av människan krävde människan. Även Ray hastighet. Och Ray visade människan hur. Även hastighet hastighet. Genom hastighet kan vi lämna det mänskliga i Även oss. Även hastighet hastighet. Och bli till gudar. Hastighet gör Gud av människan Och vi är dess kyrka Och vi är dess kyrkas tillbyggnare Honda Marlboro Ferrari Philip Morris Toyota Mobile Renault Porsche BMW Camel Mercedes Argent Pirelli 7-Eleven Firestone Coca-Cola Bridgestone PepsiCo Shell Kodak Shell National Shell Delphine Shell Livestock Fujiwara Canadian Club Well, Phillips. Well, yes. So that was the opening, and um, um, this was the first time I, uh, uh, that I've worked with actors like this. And, and uh, the text here is rather poetic. It's it's not a theatre play. It's a small, like a radiophonic work with it, with these three actors, and the actors are <coughs> like, yeah. It, it's an ensemble of six performers, really. So it's like a musical ensemble very much, but. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things that happened, because I really uh, found it problematic when I started working with the actors, okay, how, uh, how should you write the score? How should you actually do this? Should you like, notate it very precisely? Or and how should you write the instruments and so on? And uh, what I did was, uh, uh, starting by actually uh, meeting the actors in the studio, and I recorded the text. I mean, we didn't know how, I mean, how it to be expressed and how it should be performed really but um, we just they, they read the text and I recorded it and and uh, then I kind of started working with it with, by by, by um, uh, working with it in the computer by mixing and, and uh, also stretching it when I needed to have it slower or faster time compression uh, for the words and so on so I, I started working with it like a radiophonic work or making a kind of demo of the piece and out from that, I, I, I started writing the score. So that was, I mean, simple in, in many ways, but, but also so important that not working with the text on the paper, but working with the text as recording material, really. So that was the starting point. And then we continued uh, in the studio, of course. But uh, so I wrote the score out from the, from the uh, recordings, really. And um, um, so the score became a mixture of different techniques, and you can see uh, how I mean the three actors, and it's it's quite open in a way. So it's it has much more. Uh, for example, here, the saxophone is playing the thrill, and at that point, the actor starts uh, speaking, and at, and here the percussion player is uh, playing a, a MIDI pad triggering one sound file. So it's very much about how they react to each other. So react on certain words, or when you finish this sentence, you react, and this thing happened, you react, and so on. Uh, so it was both kind of flexible time, but also fixed in a way how they reacted to each other. And that turned out to work so really well uh, already from the first rehearsal because everybody started listening to each other they had to listen to each other so that worked uh, really well so i kind of mixed a lot of different notational techniques i mean uh, there are some i mean meters when i mean in four four when you need that there is a one punk almost punk rock music section <laughs> um uh, and so so um so so you kind of mixed uh, uh, different techniques which turned out to be, be really effective the other thing uh, I was in this piece was the the uh, you saw some pictures there. I mean the, the percussion uh, instruments was built up 
like a lot of junk, like an oil barrel and, and uh, car parts <laughs> playing also. So uh, it was uh, that I built uh, or had some help to build uh, these instruments. It was a lot of special built instruments. Both these, uh, like, uh, yeah, really do it yourself instrument on the one hand, and, and then a lot of uh, sample instrument also for the, like, the MIDI, I had a MIDI guitar and the MIDI pads and so on. So there were also. That was mostly sample sounds from cars and, and motors and machines and so on. Uh, so I found the, the uh, so this was kind of the starting point for this whole research project. I found it really interesting to, to work with the actors and and Theater Weimar had <coughs> done a lot of experimental theater uh, pieces for many years at that time, and they were working had started working on a piece or a performance uh, Hamlet to Exit Ghost. So. Um, uh, eventually turned into a piece with a lot of music. It was not intended to have music in it from, from the beginning, but it became a lot of live electronic in that piece. So the performance is for two actors, uh, live electronics, live video, and, um, uh, and, but, and, and this is much more of, of a, 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 I mean, basically a theater play with, uh, with a relational playing between, between the two actors, um, based of course on, on, uh, on the, classic Hamlet. Uh, so but let's, uh, here I have some video. Uh, sorry, I don't have subtitles, but it's only two, two minutes. All det här är slut nu. Det är inte slut. Det här är början. Det här är börjar. Det finns ingen börjar. Det finns ingen början. Det finns bara slut. Du älskar honom. Jag vet inte. Men det gjorde du. Du älskade honom. Det minns jag. Du sa det. Du älskade honom. Minnen av honom kanske, ja. Men han finns kvar där inuti. Han är tatuerad i själen. Men jag har ju ingenting inuti mig i själen. Det är bara svart, tomt, som kära. Jag önskar bara att jag kunde bli ren, att regnet kunde skölja bort smutsen. Det kan du. Det kan du. Hur då? Du har din faders röst. Nej, inte den. Men han är regnet. Det är hans ord, det han säger till dig. Hans ord? De kommer i alla fall aldrig. Nej, jag tror inte det. Du har en uppgift du satt i världen att fullfölja. Jag satt i världen. Det här är din plats. Det här är ditt arbete. Har jag en plats? Jag vet inte, har jag det? Här är regnet överlåtelse. Tiger. Men det är du. Det är vackert. Tycker du det? Det är inte hur du såg det som finns här inne och skulle inte säga så. Men det har jag redan. Och det skulle jag. Oavsett skulle jag. Tänk om vi skulle åka härifrån. Lämna allt där det bara blev vid. Vart skulle vi åka? Till Wittenberg. Där skulle jag boka en studierna, där skulle jag visa dig allt, ge dig allt. Allt ditt, hela dig? Allt mitt, hela mig. Och jag skulle hålla om dig och trösta dig. Och jag skulle boka en studierna och du skulle komma in och bara, här står jag. Bara, här står jag, kom och ta mig. <laughs> här står jag. Kom och ta mig. Jag står ju här. Jag står ju här. Kom och ta mig. Jag står ju här. Här. Så det är det är en det filmed clips here was uh, projected at the, at the back wall. So in fact, this was, I mean, it was two actors, but uh, in fact, there were seven, uh, seven people on stage. So, so the, the, the actors were kind of sitting uh, a bit uh, in, uh, in between all this technical stuff and, and the, the video technician was sitting there and I was sitting over there. There was a light technician and two camera persons also. So everybody was really 
playing together like like a seven piece ensemble. This was a very interesting thing. So we were all the time kind of following the ensemble and uh, uh, fo following the actors, but they also were sometimes following my music. So so there was a very very interesting interplay here all, all the time. And the the idea was here almost this was set like a kind of a TV studio. So it, it was like two actors that were gonna uh, record or film Hamlet, but couldn't really. <laughs> There were always quarrels and discussions and doubts. Um, uh, and for me, the, the interesting thing was really here because it was a very, very difficult text for the actors to work with. And it was very interesting to, 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 to follow their work uh, and see how they solve it. And that's one thing that I'm writing about uh, in the pieces, I mean, how they work and how I, uh, as a composer, uh, learned a lot how, how I can approach approach theater like that in the music and, and so it was very much about not not only really uh, connecting to the text but very much about what they were doing on stage and how they relate to what was really happening in in, in the space in, 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 re in the real sp reality in, in the re real space here and now uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, experience and uh, yeah, so, so uh, as I say, so it was very much about kind of understand uh, how the actor actors work and uh, with, with this kind of texts that are uh, dramatic but not uh, but uh, doesn't have like a, a story as in a traditional dramatic uh, play. And um, uh, also here the, the construction of instruments was important, but in this case I, I built up a, a, a Rather huge setup, uh, live electronics that I kind of played with, with Ableton Live, and some other uh, instruments from Reactor, uh, this, this software synthesizer, some Max tracks, and also some uh, other uh, hardware. Uh, so I kind of had an instrument really to play play on, similar to 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 the, to the first piece. Uh, the next piece I'm gonna uh, just play a few uh, minutes from uh, was. A, uh, performance called A Language at War that uh, was about uh, it was based on uh, some <coughs> of the ideas about language uh, language philosophy from uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, a bit uh, also fun and a bit absurd uh, performance uh, also two actors but also one singer Angela Winkerach uh, Berlin based uh, soprano with experimental extended uh, vocal techniques. Also here, electroacoustic music. Uh, I think I was having a cardophonic system for that one. And also uh, video projections. It's also uh, very important to, to, to build the, the space here. And uh, I think I have two clips. Let's see. There might be some German subtitles. My eye says that here, so to say, there's a stool. Lampa, penna, papper, stol, glas och så vidare. Och det är samma sak med tystnaden. Att tystnaden finns, den finns också. Även om det inte så att säga är samma sak. Men det är den. Samma sak. Problemet är bara detta. Tystnaden är skriken. Som man kanske inte kan kalla en beskrivning av ett självstillstånd eftersom det är primitivare än en beskrivning till sig själv och natur är likväl en beskrivning av självslivet samma sak med tystnaden samma sak med tystnaden tystnaden, tystnaden kan också vara ett skrik eller, 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 eller samma sak en skrik en beskrivning av ett självstillstånd jag fortsätter jag läser böcker Okay, and I think I have another section with, uh, see, with, uh, yeah, with a video. Video And uh, the text uh, uh, projected here in Tarot is on a the transparent <laughs> material. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 
Skratta mer. Inte bara här inte. Här, utan eh, överallt. Överallt. Även, även utanför mig själv. Även utanför mig själv. Jag vill inte att det ska fastna. Skrattet. Interesting uh, thing with uh, with uh, making this performance was that uh, this I think was our fourth uh, uh, production together, and and now the kind of working order changed a lot. I mean, we, uh, uh, things were done much more in parallel. Uh, it actually started more with musical ideas. I started with some musical ideas with Angela, with the soprano before Jorgen started writing the text. So it was much more like developing things much more um, at the same time more, uh, in contrast to if you say traditional opera where you usually write the text first and then you do the music and then you do the scenography in this case I mean there were like music and even some uh, then ideas for the scenography were, came very early long before the text was uh, finished and so on and um, so that uh, and also how we also the whole ensemble worked out the dramaturgical structure of the whole performance um, was uh, very special and um, uh, since I mean now this was just uh, a few seconds from the performance which is about I think 65 minutes in all in all uh, it's not that much sounding music in this performance but music as such is, is important and because uh, uh, Fundamentally, the, some musical uh, structures or musical ideas uh, were, were, in, uh, uh, were the basic concept. Like you had kind of variation form as one thing that you go through, and also uh, this, op uh, 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 this sonic exploration of words and how, how the how the language dissolved into into sound and so on. So there were some musical principles that were uh, that were. Um, like the base for, for, for the for creating the performance, and uh, so uh, in um, this is uh, the kind of a um, concept that you find is something called composed theater, um, which uh, is a term a rather new, uh, n not not the, the the concept in itself, but but uh, it came a book in. Uh, 2013 called Composed Theater Aesthetics, Practices and Processes, uh, edited by Matthias Rebstock and David Rösner. And it's a it's a collection of, of uh, essays from, from different uh, practitioners, and um, um, they uh, it's an opening chapter uh, by Rebstock discussing this field of uh, which is actually stretches from the uh, I mean throughout the whole 20th century. Where, where, um, as I say, it's it's not really about a genre, but as it says, uh, organizing the theatrical event through musical principles, using organizing the things that are happening on stage, um, not only the sound, but but everything, movement or or text and, and uh, light and sonography and everything through through musical principles. So that's the kind of basic thing, and that that is one thing you find throughout the 20th century. The other thing in here that um, uh, you also find working in such a way, uh, you can also see it, it's rather, it, it is very different from from, uh, from a traditional work uh, because the, 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 uh, the working process tend to be much more collaborative, which in turn means that the roles that you have, like, a, like as a composer or director, uh, change. It, it has to be different than, than what we, how we normally work. And I think I have the next slide, yes. In composed theater, compositional thinking is at the heart of the creation process 
articulated, for example, as an active interaction with an interrogation of musical concepts, such as working with motifs and permutation, musical rhetoric, rhythmical forms of shaping time, thinking in parameters such as pitch, duration, volume and timbre, etc. Very often this is also expressed by making use of musical notation. Composed theater is further defined as a field of artistic practice that is situated between the more classical conceptions and institution of music, theater and dance. It is characterized by a particular process rather than a particular outcome. Often promotes a rethinking of hierarchies between the different elements of theater as well as the artistic roles associated with these. And uh, uh, David Rosner uh, uh, published uh, another book called, uh, uh, that is closely related to this, called Musicality in Theatre, Music as Model, Method and Metaphor in Theatre Making, where he, uh, well, there are some theoretical uh, or overarching chapters, but uh, he discuss uh, some practitioners, uh, Apia, Ator, Meyerhold, Heinrich Goebbels, and Katie Mitchell, and writes that certain paradigms of theater, such as mimetic representation or linear narrative, have large, largely been rejected by the power bearers of contemporary theater and replaced with an astonishing variety of scenic forms and performative styles. Musicality, I would argue, became one of the vehicles in the pluralism of, of solutions on this road to rejection of master narratives and their implied hierarchies. Um, very, very interesting book. Uh, 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 well, uh, I can highly recommend it. And, um, and um, so, uh, so it's, it's much about, I mean, kind of rethinking of the theatrical stage and, and, and about the, the elements that we work with or can work with. And, and and the stage, and uh, we don't have to go into all this. It's, uh, I mean, the different kind of text or acting movement, sound, how we work with visual, how we think of the performance space. There, I mean, there are so many possibilities, so many elements to play with that we can also approach in this in a musical way. And um, uh, just to mention a few names that. Uh, that are mentioned in, in these books uh, that also, have, I would say, have been important to us. Uh, you will find uh, at least Heine Goebbels, also George Apeguis, uh, Manos Sangaris, and uh, some of the directors, uh, um, mostly Theater uh, Weimar, much of their influences came from, from Germany, from Berlin, and from Volksbühne and Schaubühne, from the theaters there. Uh, Kate Mitchell, Rob Wilson, Polish, and Thomas Ostmeyer, and Christoph Martel, and and uh, uh, the the um, the uh, I should say the text. If you're interested in the dramatic text, uh, you will find on the website. I'll tell you in a second. Uh, you will find all all the texts by uh, Dahlqvist. Uh, there are all translated uh, to English, so you will find them in English, even in some in German. Uh, so you will find it there if you're interested in dramatic writing. Uh, I just did not have time to subtitle all the videos. <laughs> I should have done it, but uh, sometimes you don't have time for er everything. But uh, the playwrights in, in, in this area, uh, say Elfriede Jelinek, uh, Sarah Kane, and Martin Krimp, I think are some influential writers for, for, for Jordan there. Um, uh, just checking time, yeah, we have some time. Um, um, as I say, the, these five performances are rather different, and uh, uh, the fourth piece here is a piece for, or a performance for, including a string orchestra, a vocal ensemble, three actors, similar to the first one uh, we saw, uh, and also video here and, and uh, some electronics. And um, uh, in this case, it's it's more using the the, the concert form. It's it's. It's a, like a concert, and it has a full score. You also find that on, on, on the website if you're interested. So this 
making a piece like this, uh, it had had to be like a. Uh, it, it would have been fun if we had had a lot of time just to work with a string orchestra, but that is too expensive. So in this case, you have to deliver material. But by taking the experiences from the other performances, this was I could kind of take that into while writing the score. The score is I mean, part <coughs> much of it is quite traditional like metric but uh, there are also some more open open parts of it uh, also combining uh, different techniques and um, even if it's uh, um, well this is kind of more of an interesting discussion uh, I, I, I wasn't thinking very much about it when, when, when doing when doing this piece uh, because we did a few performances at different places, and one of the places was uh, like a, in a black box of a place where you normally do like experimental performing art, dance or electronic music or yeah, experimental perf performances and so on. Uh, and we also played at the kind of traditional concert hall. And it's interesting to note how different you, you experience the piece when we, because when you put it in the concert hall, okay, then it's a concert with some added video and some added act uh, actors and so on, but it's really, in that context, it's really the expectation of, yeah, you see, it's a concert, it's a string orchestra, and they move a bit and you have some video, but it's a concert. While in the black box, it was actually something very different. You, you have this, the formations become really like, uh, yeah, you use, you're taking this classical, classical uh, kind of strings, but it becomes much more of a, different kind of performance really and that was quite interesting but something I realized uh, long after uh, that it worked so much better of course in, in this black, bo black box uh, have <coughs> these are I have subtitled um, at least and the, the, the text uh, for this one uh, this it was much uh, much more political about uh, about refugees about borders migration which you know uh, has been one topic in Sweden with closing the borders and, uh, and so on
sections uh, of the piece I wanted uh, to this last one also so, so uh, that it's kind of changing uh, setting on stage was also an important part because they slowly at some part just moving around so so the last part is finished as if in a long long row for example like we have here um, and um, um, so one one other thing that I write about and, and discuss in the in the text uh, is, is the uh, because there are so many kind of ideas and, and concepts that are that built this work. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned, the, the political topics here, the text uh, come both from from connecting to some old Greek uh, drama as well as some writings by Hannah Arendt uh, about. Uh, uh, her own experience as being a refugee from the, from the Nazis in, in the Second World War. Uh, I'm using material from the Rite of Spring and also the, the ballet uh, story there, as well as some inspirations from Sinakis. The way of working with live video, uh, because there is a, uh, one part of the stage is a film set, and you sometimes film one and project it at the same time and mix. At one point you're mixing uh, clipping between pre-recorded things and, and the live live things. So that's really interesting also to work with this possibility with video. And in, in the thesis, I, I also uh, yeah, I write quite a lot about the work with it. I mean, about with this piece, for example, how how we structure the whole thing, because you have to kind of plan, not, not only like the score, the music, but really like, OK, they have to move and how long time they have to move. and. What do the actors do, and where do, where do we have the video, and how should the light be, and so on? So we, we talk a bit about this to make these kind of schemes for for grasping the whole the whole performance. And so, so I will quickly yeah, move on to I will Can play. I just ask yeah. the text material for that last piece. How did it come about? The you, you mean the, the the writing? Yeah. Uh, oh, it was written by Jürgen Dahlqvist, the playwright. Okay, uh, based on on stories or based on. No, uh, uh, I mean the um, uh, the um, uh, yeah yeah. There there is a kind of story in it of someone who is escaping from some place. It's it's not very clear, but it it's not it's no real story, but it's someone is escaping from some country and trying to get in. To hear and, and you meet uh, come to this border and in the end uh, uh, the uh, come to refugee camp and and the, and the camp is being burned down, mm. which is happening, not not so seldom in that that people that there are fires and, and, and refugee camps also in Sweden, so it's a kind of the uh, also the sacrifice of uh, of this young woman who's escaping. Like like the escape, uh, like the sacrifice in, in the rite of spring, mm. and that was kind of a uh, uh, story. But then uh, Jorgen, uh, I mean, you use uh, maybe not quotations, but kind of inspiration from Hannah Arendt and from. I mean, some of the texts are, are also kind of archaic, connected to the to the Trojan women, mm. uh, to some Greek things. So some are archaic. Uh, so there are really many layers of, of text material. Mm. That he's interwoven into this, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. I hope that was it. <laughs> so to your question. Yes, yeah. or uh, I was just curious because it's uh, such a such a personal experience of like being a refugee, and um, I was just curious about how you worked with that very personal experience. Oh. And I saw the whole ensemble seemed very white. It's like, is this something that well, well, actually, bothered you? Or well, you uh, well, well, actually, I mean, one, one of the things here is not really that you, I mean, you cannot, of course, not share the experience of someone escaping. So it's not about really, uh, maybe that should say that it, it's not about trying to like, like stage or, or uh, someone escaping. It's much more about uh, the writing about Hannah Arendt uh, is really questioning the, the, the word of, of, uh, of we refugees. She's uh, problematizing actually the word, uh, and because how we how we uh, how how 
it's it's much more about people in the country how you look at people coming rather than about the store. So it actually has very much to do also about the language in this piece, about the language used by, for example, journalism and how you write about. And it says in many places that how how we write their stories. We write their stories. So it's it's not about it's much more about us. <laughs> So to say, us here more about someone who's the, who is escaping, really, because it, as it says, it's, it's uh, about how we write their stories, really. So, so mm. yeah, no, no. Of course, you you, you cannot. Uh, yeah. Then you would have to to do it in another way, of course. So it, it has, yeah, it's more uh, problematizing actually. Also, language in that way problematizing language and the language used and the kind of word we put on people mm. in those situations. Uh, which uh, yeah, it's very interesting. It's an interesting piece. So. Uh, I will, the last last piece here is um, more called felt. Uh, in felt, we encounter a chorus of voices that revolves around the conditions of existence. The performance takes place somewhere between life and death, in a dream about something else on the other side of the field, far away from violence, heroin and glue, children getting abused. Houses and ruins, and a small pony toy lying around on the street, waiting for a child to pick it up again. The performance is a descent into the hell that is everyday life in a war zone. Mama, Mama, a farm between the Mama. Svara. Jag kan inte sova. Du Vad fan är det för fel på mig då? Jag vill inte komma med pappa. Vad fan är det för fel på mig då? Det kan inte säga. Va? Du måste försöka sova. Va? Du har ju en leksak. Solen skiner. Vad fan är det för fel på mig då? Vad fan är det för fel på mig då? Världen. Vad fan är det för fel på mig då? Det är det som om världen. Vad fan är det för fel på mig då? Vad fan är det för fel på mig då? Ja. Vad fan är det för fel på mig då? Ja. Vad fan är det för fel på mig då? Min berättelse. Min frihet. Vad? Nej.
kind of it's a uh, uh, really mixed uh, theater like concert radio play and there were quite a lot of video or like movie uh, we even performed this at one time in in a movie uh, in the cinema which worked really fine with a, with a big screen with and the performance in front of it uh, soundscapes and so on and also uh, there um, this this um, performance it's overlaying very very many stories that are different but somehow seems connected in in, in, in different ways and uh, there's one actor just one actor and but he's kind of doing all all the voices all the characters and her voice is live and, and she is on all the movies and she is also pre-recorded uh, <coughs> I'm placing the voices around the audience um, which uh, I found to be very very effective and also creating this kind of soundscape so it's a um, uh, one um, one uh, notion that I talk about quite a lot and that you find um, many pr other practitioners are using is polyphony uh, so to talk about the polyphony of, of, of uh, theater performance with many layers of many elements uh, playing like a, like a musical polyphony like independent voices <coughs> and uh, so that is one thing that I that I uh, uh, write about and David Rösner talks about intermediate po polyphony and says the notion of polyphony carries a sense of, a, of an autonomy of individual voices layers and media within a greater whole in which we structural and semantic relations can be renegotiated, <laughs> renegotiated and form new and previously uncommon connections, hierarchies and patterns of mutual impact. So from um, and uh, yes, I think that I will. So this is uh, the chapters in the book. I will just show you very quickly the, the, the website of this. So. In chapter five, I, I talk about the, the, these works and, and we focus on the, on the composition on my on my compositional work, but also the creative processes in these works that I've been talking about a bit here and the background of the works. In, in ch chapter six, I talk more on an overarching uh, level on about the where I look at the musical composition as a dramaturgical strategy in these cases. In chapter seven, uh, I um, uh, uh, discuss more the, the collaborative methods, and uh, in, uh, yeah, it starts with a background chapter, uh, and in, in chapter three and four, it's about this composed theater, musicalization of theater, and also about my compositional background. So um, I've tried to, or it. It is, I've tried to make it in such a way. You, I mean, you can write, read it from the beginning to the end, but I think it's, you can also go in and actually read any chapter. And uh, I mean, if you're interested in one particular work here, it's possible just to go in and read about one of the work or a certain aspect of, of those. So this is the website. So, um, because in the, in the text, I write blah, 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 blah. And, and then there says exam, example, that and that and that example. And you will find, for, uh, uh, let's see if we just take something here from Felt. Uh, so on the first page here, uh, it's information about it, and you will find the texts and, uh, and the text in English and, uh, and, the, and the documentation of it here. And then here, here are the examples. Let's see if the internet isn't. Yeah, so. So then you have the here have the the different examples here, and also uh, I've put in some, for example, from 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 uh, rehearsal sessions or when we work with things, and then how it uh, how it is in the final version and so on. So I um, uh, have that here and. Um, so there is a lot of examples for chapter five and chapter six. Uh, you have the one page here with documentations, and recordings, and so on, and uh, and the full list of works here. And as I said, you will find 
on the first page down here you can find a PDF PDF of the thesis like this and um, I can find empty. <laughs> yes, totally empty. No, just now. Let's see. Okay. Now let's see if this let's see if this is working. Yes, it's working. Mm. So you can click on a, uh, on a, one of these example. If you read it on the PDF, you should be able to click. They come directly to that example. Oh. And and. Uh, at least my idea was to, to, I mean, that you can go into certain things that you, if you're interested in. So I've tried to, because there are so many aspects and, uh, of this, I mean, working with the text or the sonography or the composition. And that's also different, uh, for example, with, with a string orchestra, I talk a bit about the chord structure and, and so on. While in other pieces it's about the electronic music or the sonography and, and so on. Uh, I guess it's time for lunch, really. I mean, there are so many, <laughs> as you have probably seen so, so <laughs> m much material in this. In this uh, so uh, I guess we can continue talking about it. But I don't know if there are like a quick question before yeah, lunch. Sure. Uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> what are your experiences on working with electroacoustic music in the theater compared to working with instrumental music in the theater? Oh, um, um, I mean, if you start, if you, if you, st if you start with it, on the and, yeah. and also the result, of course. I, I mean, uh, one of the when it comes to elec uh, ele electroacoustic music is, is it, uh, I mean, <laughs> maybe it sounds stupid to generalize, but it, it's working so well I mean, because one of the things, especially when working with specialized sound in theater, is, is seem to be very little used. Uh, actually, I mean. Because I mean, you can. I mean, there's so many possibilities with specialized sound, and you can play speakers in different ways. And and uh, uh, particularly, I found it very uh, effective to, to combine different techniques. Like you, you can like use some ambisonic, but also like place speakers uh, in different places on stage and so on. Uh, and it's it's really working really really well. And I mean, since I mean, electroacoustic music is so flexible. I mean, you can use with and uh, you can use any sound material and so on, electronic things, or take the combine it with live uh, live uh, elements and so on. Uh, uh, it's like yeah, wow, and um, very appreciated. <laughs> I must say, I mean, it does work really well. And um, the. Um, uh, yeah. So no, no. It, it, so so it has been a very, very interesting and very. Uh, it has opened a lot of a lot of ideas because you can really take so much. I mean, there's so much things to take in and, and use. Huge feet to explore. I feel and and um, of course when it come when when you have instruments, uh, uh, instrumentalists, and actors, for example, then there's uh, the question of, of what kind of relation do they have on stage, which is also very very interesting and, and the combination of both instruments. And, but the difference is, of course, that uh, really to think of what what is the relation between the musician and, and, and the actors, and how can you use that, and how can you... Uh, there's also so many possibilities, and, and uh, as I say, in, in, for example, in Hamlet, and also in the last one, uh, Felt, I'm, I'm myself on stage uh, playing and performing, and it's... Uh, it's interesting to create the, the space for, for interacting really with, with the, not, not only like playing music in the background, but really be kind of equal uh, in, in the performance and, and have a real real interaction or create that for if you have musicians to, to have, like in the first piece really there are, that there is a really a, an interaction between between the musicians and so on, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> they want lunch, but one more question. Yeah. Uh, it's really interesting to hear. It's uh, you've done such a great work with like research and and uh, on how to combine different mediums yeah. and it's. Um, but when I when I look at these snippets, mm. I see that ev like to me every work is very political. And th therefore, I'm cu just curious how much input you have had on the f topics 
and and uh, also do you consider yourself having like a, a political agenda? Mm. Uh, um, uh, of course, it, it, as I said, it uh, it has been a very interesting journey, so to speak, because you start really like I mean being, and that is also something that I discuss in the very last chapter because it's. It's about eight years. So we, uh, we started working together in, with this Indy 500, and it worked really, really well. But of course, at that it was, it was uh, the theater and, and Jorgen, the playwright, that uh, uh, came up with the topic and, and wrote the text. And, uh, and I think his his writing, uh, not always, but but um, some of it, some of it uh, are quite political. And and um, so uh, so, but but then it was more like uh, you know, he came with a text and I had some mm -hmm. suggestions. But he really came with a text and I didn't work with the text. I put music to it. And then we added the scenography. Um, but um, um, but gradually, I mean, it, it has become much more that I mean, when you continue work and do a lot of work, I mean, your 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 roles really expand and change. I mean, uh, I'm I'm must. Uh, Myself do much more of the dramaturgical work, and Jürgen also. Uh, he knows so much about the composition, so he can really uh, suggest a lot of things, or he can even start editing things just as I can edit things or any of the other. So it's interesting to see also how the roles uh, um, uh, mix in that way, and of course, then then it also coming to 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 the to the topics, of course, that you su suggest and so on, and and uh, and. For me, I found it uh, uh, interesting or important also to, to be able to work with more political uh, yeah. content, actually, uh, in a way that I, I think it has been, I've been working quite good because uh, he's, he's a very, very skillful writer, Jorgen, and, and can also do, uh, I mean, connecting to your question before, he can kind of do texts that are not that simple. I mean, you, you're not saying just one, uh, this is how it is, but you more problematize things really on, on, on difficult topics. And I, I like that very much, and I find it, uh, I have to say as a composer, also very rewarding to be able to work with also more political uh, content really in, in performances. Not, not, not all of these, uh, but, but in, in quite many that has been, um, so yeah. We can go. We we need lunch. now. We need lunch. I'll be happy to to uh, continue discussing over lunch or over beer or whatever. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.